Throughout the 1930s and into 1940, American railroads had been experimenting with streamlining, whether that be streamlining individual locomotives or creating an entire train with a unique streamlined design. However, this suddenly came to a halt with the onset of World War II. Valuable materials like steel were now being directed towards military purposes rather than elegant passenger trains. One of the last new streamliner trains before the war would be on the day it began for the United States. On December 7, 1941, the New York Central Railroad debuted its revamped Empire State Express service using brand new stainless steel Bud Company passenger cars. The J3A Hudson powering the train had shrouding done by Mr. Chase H. Knowlton and Mr. George M. Davies. Henry Dreyfus was not involved with this project. The train's inauguration was greatly overshadowed by the bombing of Pearl Harbor. It wouldn't be until after the war that new streamlined trains would return. After World War II's ultimate end on September 2, 1945, American railroads would look towards the future and resume building new equipment as usual. Michigan's Pierre Marquette Railway was just one of the railroads to jump in on this. While the company was well known for its N1 Berkshire locomotives hauling fast freights, the railroad had yet to enter the streamliner market. This would soon change in 1946. Robert R. Young, who was an American financier, had acquired interest and control in the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway, New York Central, Pier Marquette, among other roads. He had a taste for luxury trains and thought that Pier Marquette should capitalize on the American post-war prosperity. Thus, on August 10, 1946, the seven-car Pier Marquette streamliner train was created, a radical departure from the usual railroad's appearance the name of which was derived from Jacques Marquette, sometimes known as Pierre Marquette, who established Michigan's first European settlement in Sault Ste. Marie in 1668. Running 153 miles between Detroit's Fort Street Station and Grand Rapids, Michigan, the train's concepts would be led by a brand new 2,000 horsepower E7 locomotive. These were painted in a unique blue, yellow, and silver livery with road numbers 101 and 102. Behind the locomotive would typically be a Pullman Standard Railway Post Office baggage car, an express baggage car, one observation coach, one standard coach, a dining car, one standard coach, and one last observation coach. Three daily round trips would leave Detroit early in the morning, in the afternoon, and another in the late afternoon. The return train from Grand Rapids and the arrival in Detroit would be around the same time. Each trip one way would take around three hours. Connecting trains to Toledo, Ohio and Chicago, Illinois could be made as well. The train could seat around 250 passengers and proved to be an instant success and the Pure Marquette Railway saw a huge surge in ridership. Robert R. Young had also introduced some changes, including phoning ahead for train reservations and paying for tickets aboard the train instead of at the station. While the Pure Marquette train wasn't the first new train after World War II, it was the first all new to be built after the war. It was also around this time that six more E7 locomotives, numbered 103 to 108, arrived to expedite the dieselization of the PM's passenger operations. However, the Pierre Marquette Railway itself was only able to relish in its success for less than a year. As World War II ended, Robert R. Young planned for the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway to absorb the Pierre Marquette. So, on June 6, 1947, the PM merged with the CNO. Later that July, Four more E7s numbered 95 to 98 arrived after the merger. These locomotives now had CNO markings but retained the Pure Marquette's livery. With all these new units and then new passenger equipment arriving in late 1948, the CNO would expand its streamliners to Chicago, another move that proved popular with Pure Marquette riders looking to make connections. Some of this equipment, though, was from the Chessy luxury streamliner train that was canceled before it ever turned a wheel. For a few years thereafter until 1951, the Pierre Marquette trains would run with a dome car. Another change would occur in the early 1950s where the classic 1946 equipment was sold off to the Chicago and Eastern Illinois Railroad in favor of new Pullman standard equipment. This coincided with the CNO repainting their Pierre Marquette E units into CNO's livery of Enchantment Blue, Federal Yellow, and Gray. From there, the CNO continued to run Pierre Marquette trains with a refreshed concept to keep things modern and enticing to passengers. In 1964, the CNO would then apply the Pure Marquette name to its Grand Rapids to Chicago trains. At this point, the average Detroit to Grand Rapids train had two to four coaches and a dining car with a single E7. On the other hand, Chicago to Grand Rapids trains with a connection to Muskegon and Traverse City were longer being led by two E7 locomotives. The concept was a combination of an RPO car, baggage car, two or three coaches, a lunch counter lounge car, 
and one or two 10-6 sleepers. But as the mid to late 1960s rolled in, the United States' passenger rail infrastructure declined quickly with each new passing year. Fortunately, the Pierre Marquette service remained on the CNO's timetable up until Amtrak's takeover of most American passenger rail on May 1, 1971. Just prior to this point, the Pierre Marquette trains had a single round trip between Grand Rapids and Chicago, two trips between Detroit and Grand Rapids, and a single connecting train to Holland and Muskegon after Traverse City was cut off in October 1966. None of these trains were continued by Amtrak. The railroad had been concerned about low ridership from ease of automobile travel. It wouldn't be until August 4th, 1984, that a revived Pierre Marquette service was initiated through strong financial support of the Michigan Department of Transportation. Amtrak's Pierre Marquette train would run 176 miles north from Chicago, making stops in Hammond, Whiting, Indiana, then moving into Michigan, New Buffalo, St. Joseph, Benton Harbor, Bangor, Holland, until the final stop of Grand Rapids. The northbound train would become 370 and the southbound 371. The inaugural train was decorated with American and Michigan flags, while F40PH number 219 and 218 led the train. The consist included nine Amfleet coaches, a heritage lounge car, heritage sleeping car, and track inspection car number 10,000. Crowds met the train along the way, celebrating its revival. Amtrak's Pier Marquette ended up being rather popular for its tourist destination stops and scenic connections with Lake Michigan. However, a few service changes would take place over its service life. The Hammond Whiting stop was removed on April 29, 2001, over complaints of delays by Norfolk Southern, plus low ridership. The train then removed its new Buffalo stop on October 26, 2009, as a new station stop opened up on Amtrak's Michigan line, replacing the one on the former CNO main line. From there, Amtrak's Pier Marquette route had been solidified. As for its consist, F40 PHs were typically used, but eventually replaced by a P32-8 BWH and or a Genesis locomotive. For ease of push-pull operation, a non-powered control unit or a second locomotive was often employed as well. Most recently, a Siemens SC44 Charger locomotive has been used for the train. As for its coaches, the service is unique amongst its fellow Michigan service trains, as it frequently uses superliners as opposed to Horizons or Amfleet cars. This is especially common in winter, as Horizon cars develop reliability issues during the season. Typically, three superliner cars have been in service, with two coaches and one cafe. Otherwise, four to five Horizons or Amfleets are typically used, with one always being a cafe car. Unfortunately, on November 30th, 2007, a southbound Pier Marquette train collided with a Norfolk Southern train in Chicago, injuring 71 people. The National Transportation Safety Board determined the cause was an Amtrak engineer failing to comprehend a signal. The blame was placed on Amtrak for not ensuring the engineer had the understanding of the signals. On a more positive note though, in 2014, Grand Rapids received a new modern station named the Vernon J. Ayler Station in honor of the former Michigan congressman. This replaced the small depot built in 1984 at the corner of Wealthy Street and Market Avenue. Grand Rapids Union Station, served by the CNO's Pier Marquette, had been built in 1900 but was demolished in 1959 for the US 131 freeway. The new station allowed for improved train to bus transport along with easier train turnarounds. The most recent schedule is as follows. The train leaves Chicago at 6.30 p.m. and arrives into Grand Rapids at 11.34 p.m., taking four hours and four minutes. The train heads back for Chicago from Grand Rapids at 6 a.m., arriving in Chicago at 9.08 a.m., taking four hours and eight minutes. The railroad makes use of tracks owned by CSX, Norfolk Southern, and Burlington Northern Santa Fe. From there, Amtrak's Pier Marquette has had a relatively stable run up until 2021. While its appearance has long changed since the luxury Pullman standard days on the Pier Marquette and CNO, the train still maintains scenic views and quality travel between major cities in Michigan and Illinois. It can be overshadowed by its fellow Blue Water and Wolverine trains which operate much faster, but sometimes it's nice to take things a little bit slower on Amtrak's scenic Pier Marquette train. Mm -hmm.